All right. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I like that. That's actually good energy for, uh, like, afternoon in the dark in February. So um, thank you. Hi, I'm Becca. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of community for the Berkman Klein Center um, here at Harvard University. We're really grateful that you're here to join us. Um, we want to start by acknowledging that Harvard is located on the traditional ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce you to our speakers. We have Brian Vordren and Alan Rawl, who are speaking to us today about the Federal Bureau of <laughs> Investigations Cyber Division, their strategy, and we'll talk through some case studies. Um, this is the fifth in a series of events sponsored by the ORC Fund for the Colloquium on Cybersecurity and Cyber Law. Okay, BIOS. Uh, Brian Vordren was named Assistant Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigations Cyber Division in March 2021, having most recently served as the special agent in charge of the New Orleans field office. He joined the FBI as a special agent in 2003. In 2008, he was part of the International Contract Corruption Task Force in Afghanistan. He was promoted to supervisory special agent in 2009 and was assigned to the counterterrorism division at headquarters. He was promoted to unit chief in 2012. In 2013, he led the Washington Field Office's Joint Terrorism Task Force. He was promoted to Assistant Special Agent in charge of the Cyber and Counterintelligence Programs at the Baltimore Field Office in 2016. <laughs> the next year, he was promoted to Chief of the Strategic Operations Section of the Counterterrorism Division at Headquarters. He was named Deputy Assistant Director of the Criminal Investigative Division in 2018 and is an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Alan Rawl is a uh, serves as a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School here. here. Yeah. Um, he's the founder of Sidley Law Firm's highly ranked global privacy and cybersecurity practice and is a member of the firm's top ranked crisis management and strategic response team. He represents companies on US and international privacy, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and technology issues. He's represented a number of leading technology and internet companies whose devices, software, or users have been exploited by state-sponsored threat actors, who typically involve extens which typically involves extensive coordination with US and international law enforcement, cybersecurity, and regulatory agencies, and intelligence services. So you guys know a lot about what you're talking about. We're so grateful that you're here with us and that we'll learn with you tonight. Um, to our virtual attendees in the ceiling, hello. Um, please note that this event is being recorded, um, but you as audience members will not be seen. Um, and finally, we strive to inc uh, create inclusive, accessible events here at the Berkman Klein Center. For any questions, comments, concerns, or ideas for future gatherings, please contact events at cyber.harvard.edu. Your feedback is critical to our success, and that's a real leap welcome any engaged thoughtful feedback that you have so share with us um with that thank you again for joining us today uh and let me hand over the I'll mic take, in the floor i'll take it uh, there first you go. momentarily thank, thank you becca you. for the introduction thank you all for joining in person and those of you virtually and to berkman klein thanks for hosting uh this event this very timely event on uh challenges uh, that the FBI is, is facing and, and fixing in, in many cases, and we're going to hear about that. Um, in, in line with the introduction that Becca just provided, I've had the privilege to engage in what was it, extensive uh, coordination and interaction with law enforcement uh, in, the, in the person of uh, one uh, assistant director, Brian Borgen, sitting uh, to, to my left. Uh, and um, I, you know, as I said, uh, we had a, a chance to discuss with my class on cybersecurity before the, um, the, the, the really the, the, the success that the private sector very often has in working with the Federal Bureau of Investigation on cyber investigations, where uh, the companies uh, and organizations that find themselves on, on, you know, on the wrong side of a <laughs> cyber uh, threat actor 
uh, engage with the FBI, uh, you know, not in the same context. We were talking a little bit about with, the, with my class of law students that uh, the FBI is not a regulatory agency. It's a, a law enforcement agency and also an intelligence, part of the intelligence uh, community and treats uh, the, the victims of cyber attacks, in fact, as victims, not as perpetrators. The FBI leaves that to other agencies in the federal government to uh, provide that, that treatment to, to companies that, uh, again, are, have the, uh, the sorrow of being a victim of a cyber attack. So it really is an honor, certainly for me uh, personally, for Harvard more broadly, to, to have the cyber lead at the FBI um, join us today, especially at a time when there's so much going on that the FBI and the, the US government is involved in, in, in fending off and, and taking down uh, cyber attacks uh, against US interests. So with that, I'll, um, I'll turn it over to Assistant Director Warren. He's gonna, he has some slides, then uh, uh, I, I'll probably ask a question or two and open it up to questions from the in-person audience. Sadly, we're not uh, logistically able to take questions from the, the virtual audience, but I trust that there'll be lots of questions uh, here. So with that, turn it over to Assistant Director Bordren for slides, and then we'll go to questions. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to stand. Um, I'm going to power through some slides so we can get to the Q&A. Uh, Director Chris Ray testified yesterday in an open hearing in front of the uh, Chinese subcommittee in the House. And um, if anyone had the opportunity to listen to that testimony, it's very, very well done. It's a very accurate depiction of the current threat environment we face with China specifically. I'll be more broad than that. My goal tonight in the foundational slides is really to walk you through the authorities that underpin how we do our work and then walk through some case examples. Just really briefly, uh, we're spread throughout the United States. We have 300 offices. Uh, we obviously have a deep um, international portfolio as well. We're in about 70 countries worldwide. We have dedicated cyber capability in 16 countries uh, with a growth plan to get to 22 by the end of the calendar year 24. I just share that because I think it's important to understand where we fit domestically and internationally. So I just want to really briefly go through the interagency. <clears throat> so the interagency within the US government and the intelligence community when it comes to cyber is complicated. But when you distill it down and understand the policies and authorities that define each of our missions, it's actually very clearly defined. So in no particular order, CIA is obviously the foreign intelligence arm of the US government. CISA has responsibility for net defense here in the United States. So essentially producing, providing, sharing intelligence, taking best practices to raise the net defense uh, capability of all public and private sector organizations in the US, United States. NSA, I think, speaks for itself. The National Security Council has a very, very active role in the cyber ecosystem within the U.S. government uh, because of the interplay with the diplomatic channels that the U.S. government finds itself in. OFAC is the sanctions entity. U.S. Secret Service traditionally works financial crimes. They touch base into the cyber ecosystem a little bit with traditional investigations. And then our role, I just put our mission statement, which is derived from our strategy. It's essentially work with public and private sector partners, both domestically and globally, to design strategic disruption plans to impose costs on our adversaries. Uh, we'll talk about the forms that that takes here briefly. Okay, I wanna go into this, this is really important. I'm not trying to be a policy wonk here, um, but I think this is really, really, really important, okay? The FBI's authorities, what actually allows us to legally do the work that we do, this is what this slide speaks to. We have broad Title 18 investigative authority. That matters because Section 1030 of the U.S. Code in the legal world, it talks about unauthorized access to a computer network, computer system, right? That's where we reside in the FBI cyber program. Uh, almost every one of our cases is focused on that criminal activity. Rule 41 search and seizure becomes really, really important, and we'll touch on the case about this later in the conversation. The Rule 41 has a very important clause in it that says the FBI can seize quote unquote instrumentalities of a crime. When we think about that, we think about it in terms of the physical world. So we would say, of course, the FBI can seize a weapon that was used to commit a crime. But we would also articulate that 
Malware surreptitiously installed by the Chinese on U.S. infrastructure is an instrumentality of a crime, and therefore we can seize that as well, and we'll provide an example of that. We have broad counterintelligence authorities that basically say any time a nation state adversary uh, targets a U.S. organization, the FBI has a role in that. Broad domestic intelligence authorities that, that show in the presence of Executive Order 12333 and Title 50 post 9-11. Broad Title I and Title III FISA, which essentially says we can conduct search and surveillance of foreign persons here in the United States that are tied to a nation state. And then FISA 702, which says if we can prove that an individual doesn't have plus per standard, and it proves that an individual is not located in the United States, we can collect on them under 702. One really important note on that, um, if uh, an individual is not based in the United States, does not have constitutional protections here, but is using U.S. communication infrastructure to facilitate um, activity, we can collect on that even though it's on, on, on U.S. infrastructure. Okay, how do we approach doing our work in the FBI from a cyber perspective? We distilled it down into these four key slides. Right? We will always play the long game of traditional rule of law. Right? We will always try to take players off the field through traditional prosecutions. That's in our DNA. It's something we'll always pursue. But we're also under no illusions that we're going to indict and arrest our way out of a global problem. It's not going to happen. But I think the American people should reasonably expect that we will always keep our eye downrange to understand what we can do through our traditional law enforcement. Secondly, we need to leverage our domestic intelligence collected, collection to inform private sector, to inform public sector, to inform our domestic and international partners about, in my world, how the cyber threat is presenting itself here in the United States. That is an authority given to us post 9-11 that is extremely, extremely important for us to fulfill from a mission perspective and something we take very, very personally and very professionally. Number three is pressure the threat. We need to initiate joint sequence operations with public and private sector partners, both domestically and globally, to impose costs on our adversaries. I describe it as anything from a small speed bump to a high hurdle that causes the adversary friction, causes the adversary to slow down, causes the adversary to move off infrastructure, causes the adversary to move, period, is a win for us, right? Because we can't traditionally do prosecution or um, get somebody actually back to the United States. So pressuring the threat through an all tools approach is extremely, extremely important. And lastly, victim engagement. We are, and I believe this to be true, a victim-centered organization and our commitment to victims is very, very personal to us. A victim of a cyber crime remains a victim, right? And we will treat those individuals that way. We don't share their information outside the FBI. Um, and we treat them that way. The reason that is so important is because the victims of cybercrime possess really critical intelligence that allows us to do our jobs better. So to enable that sharing from a victim to the FBI of critical intelligence is a very, very important part of our value proposition that we try to hit every day. Okay, I'm gonna go into a little bit of a different presentation I usually give. I'm just gonna go through the ransomware ecosystem here really well because I think especially for this audience, I actually find it uh, quite interesting. So the gig economy, right? Shared and access, right? So we know it in terms of DoorDash, Uber, Grubhub, where you have car A, car B, car C that are running on those apps, right? They're gonna use, the driver's gonna use the app that probably is most reliable and makes them the most money. <clears throat> when we look at the ransomware ecosystem, it is identical. Okay, you have your affiliates, your actors or teams around the bottom that essentially is equivalent to the cars in the previous slide. They're going to use the different ransomware variants that are most reliable, that are most effective, and that make them the most money. It's a shared economy model. We go a little bit deeper and look at the comparison. If you look at Uber's model of the app and the leadership of Uber, how the app ties into the platform, how the car ties into the transportation, a provider in terms of who owns, who drives, the navigator, etc. It's almost identical to the business model of ransomware, right? You have the high ransomware variant. There is leaders and developers of that variant and that malware. You have the panel, the payload, the weak site that is tied to the platform, and you have the affiliate or the team that's tied to the, to the team leader, uh, open source, intelligence, etc. The models are almost identical. 
when we look at the affiliate model of ransomware, the key developers of each ransomware variant essentially take a 20% cut, okay? So they sit in a cordoned off kind of royalties environment where they develop the malware, they make it available for affiliates to use and deploy, they manage the communications with the victims, but they remain cordoned off and they take a 20% cut essentially of the ransomware payment that comes through. The affiliate or the affiliate team will take 80% of the ransom that's paid. If you have an affiliate team model, which is on the right side of the screen, look at the specifics of the breakdown. The team leader of that team is going to get a 30% cut. The payload deployer is going to get a 20% cut. The pen testers, etc. The point is, it is a very, very, very sophisticated business model that is run by very capable adversaries in the criminal space. It's actually a fascinating business study for those who may be tied to the business school. So what do we do? Our, our approach is really four pillars, right? How do we target this? We target it through malware and delivery. We talk, target it through the infrastructure. We target the communications and we target the financials, right? Those are the four pillars that we believe we have to attack whenever we're looking at an adversary to impose costs. Not in every operational outcome are we able to impact every one of those four, but our goal is always to inter, impact every one of those four. So let's look at Hive. Hive was a very, very uh, prolific ransomware variant in 2022. Uh, it started primarily by targeting the healthcare industry. It's a traditional ransomware as a service model where you have key developers um, that are cordoned off, safe haven status in Russia undoubtedly, and you have an admin and affiliate model where you have an 80-20% financial split. 80% of the proceeds are going to the affiliates, 20% are going to the leadership. The first uh, victim that we actually knew of in the FBI is in July of 2021, um, and the case was run by our FBI Tampa field office because of the location of the first victim. So in July 2022, we actually were able to manufacture backend access to, through the API and actually pull the decryption keys for every victim. So what that means is when there's a ransomware attack, there's really two levels of extortion, right? You'll have an exfiltration of data and the adversary will hold that data to threaten the spilling of that data on the public internet, which forces a payment. The second extortion arm is a encryption event where the adversary will encrypt as many systems as it can in an organization. So we were able to basically manufacture backend access to get the decryption keys so that we could share the decryption keys with victims so they didn't have to pay for that second leg of the extortion, that's usually the biggest payment portion for a victim. So what were we able to see? Obviously, we were able to extract encryption keys. We were able to identify victims in process, which is hugely powerful for us and for victims. We were able to identify malware hashes, which allowed us to look at how we could defeat the malware, and a bunch of other intelligence that really helped us. So because of the ability to pull those decryption keys, we essentially saved victims about $130 million over seven months in ransomware payments. And when I talk about being victim centered, this is, these are good days for us, right? Uh, there is nothing more important that we do in our organization than helping victims in need, whether that's a victim of a violent crime, cyber crime, it doesn't matter. That's why all of us join, that's why all of us are there. So to be able to provide 1,100 decryption keys and relieve $130 million in potential extortion payments, that's a good day for us. These charts get a little bit confusing, but we estimate that the profit from Hive, the profits that Hive made before um, we were able to decrypt their encryption events were about $110 million. That's a lot of money, right? That is a lot of money from a criminal conspiracy perspective. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to go into all the details. I think one thing I would like to touch on is this. <clears throat> there's, there's new, um, CERCIA is essentially a new law coming into effect, uh, probably May of 2025 will do that, where it forces critical infrastructure to report to the U.S. government when they suffer a material cyber intrusion. The reason that's so important is because there's massive underreporting of cyber crime to the US government, which impacts our ability to have a common operating picture of what is actually happening in the victim space in the United States. Here's probably the most concerning part though. 
only 50% of hives U.S. victims were critical infrastructure. So we're going to move with Circea from 25% to 50%, but we're still going to have a gap, right, in terms of reporting that is mandated, which improves our common operating picture, but it's not going to get us to where we need to be. That's just an evolution that we as a society are going to have to continue to go through. Let's grab some more. This is just a real brief heat map of high victims. 48 states in the United States have victims in it. And uh, 88 different countries. And so the most targeted critical infrastructure sectors, healthcare, IT, government, commercial, critical manufacturing. So great case. Um, this is what we love doing. Uh, all of our operational outcomes, our victim relief, is based and a result of really good investigative work. Right. And so I think sometimes we lose sight of um, how did this actually happen? This happened by people grinding it out, by doing core investigative work in our Orlando resident agency in the Tampa field office and continue to find opportunities which led to the back end access, which led to the operational outcomes. It's a really, really good example of how we approach the infrastructure takedowns. OK, Genesis Marketplace, Genesis Marketplace in the start of 2023 the largest criminal marketplace on the internet. It operated on both the uh, open net, uh, the internet, as well as the dark web. So it's an illicit marketplace that essentially provided accounts, passwords, cookies, and digital fingerprints, which I'll explain here in a minute. Uh, it also was critical in providing initial access for onward ransomware attacks, and I'll give you an example here in a minute. Proprietary software, exceptionally well designed by the adversary, um, and for the first time, we saw US-based users at scale. And so in probably April or May of this year, uh, internally, our conversation shifted from this is a non-US problem to the problem is now starting to be present, not necessarily based, but present in the United States. And that has undoubtedly continued for the rest of 23 and into 24. Okay, for those of you who, um, use automatic password storing on your computer where it defaults your your username and your password uh, which i assume everybody in here probably does this is what could happen okay this is one example of a computer that was compromised by this what we call stealer malware of genesis and through compromising the computer in the upper left it gave the actors access to all of these stored usernames and passwords for every account that this individual used on their computer. Okay. And so it's a really, really important example about what happens if your personal computer actually gets compromised and what can be done with the browser history. Right. So just take some time when you have some time to think about how you want to mitigate that because it is a legitimate risk to all of us. Now on here, you see examples like Sony Entertainment, Amazon, Google, and you may say, hey, that's not that big of a deal in terms of vulnerabilities to me as an individual. But what happens when I'm logging into FBI accounts from my personal computer and Steeler Malware takes my browser history and takes my credentials from my FBI account or for my another, for my Johns Hopkins account off of my personal <laughs> computer? Then that gives the adversary an immediate way in through legitimate credentials to start to escalate privileges to gain persistence. And that's what happened with Genesis at scale. So this is an example of EA Games. EA Games, anybody who's in the gaming world knows FIFA, you know these games. Um, EA is behind those games and has a long history. For $10, um, some adversaries brought, bought credentials off of Genesis Marketplace that gave them access to the EA Slack channels that allowed them to manipulate access to EA, which allowed them to steal all VA's intellectual property. That's how easy it can be. The end users, right? Legitimate hackers, drug networks, and then uh, script kitties. Script kitties in our world means somebody that doesn't really have the skills to write their own malware code, so they steal it or leverage somebody else to write it from. That's what they so you have these three types of actors using Genesis. Uh, I was joking before I got in here, some of the best parts about working for the FBI is how we name our operational takedowns. 
So this one was Operation Cookie Monster. Obviously, cookies being on a, a play on cookies and the derivative ties to your browser history. So we had three objectives when we targeted Genesis, right? Pillar one, identify, target it, and arrest Genesis administrators. Pillar two, identify, target, and arrest these users in cryptocurrency, both domestically and globally. In the, in the FBI, we say CONUS and OCONUS, continental United States and outside continental United States. And pillar three, seize infrastructure. We were largely very successful on pillar two and three with this disruption that essentially forced Genesis administrators to completely walk away from their infrastructure. <clears throat> Let's just talk briefly about Hafnium. Hafnium is a China-based um, uh, group that operates at the, the direction and command and control of the Chinese government. And so <clears throat> this is my example of the value of Rule 41 to protect US infrastructure. And so we'll walk through it. So in December of 2020, uh, there were three vulnerabilities found in Microsoft Exchange. Uh, January 2nd, January 6th, Microsoft essentially releases public disseminations about the presence of those vulnerabilities. Uh, and they ultimately, on March 3rd, issued patching and remediation guidance for those vulnerabilities. On March 10th, the FBI with CISA, which is part of DHS, released a cybersecurity advisory to amplify the remediation and patch guidance from Microsoft. We in the FBI have a preference to move from least intrusive to most intrusive techniques, and I'll explain what that means here. But we have to be loyal to our mission to deal with the adversary from a mission perspective and completely neutralize their ability to impact um, the United States, right? And so our North Star is always mission focused, neutralize the adversary's capability to do harm. Within that, our preference is always to move from least intrusive to most intrusive, but the least intrusive to most intrusive always isn't an option, but in this case it was. We issue the cybersecurity advisory, then we go into mass victim notification, and I don't want to get too mired down in details here. We don't necessarily see intelligence that says this computer at this location was compromised by the Chinese. What we see is an ISP level um, piece of intelligence, and we have to dig into that through grand jury subpoena after grand jury subpoena to get to the end user level, right? That could take weeks, right? That's not an exaggeration. It could take five, six, seven rounds of grand jury subpoenas. It brings into this the element of time. So when these vulnerabilities were, were identified, um, the Chinese essentially scanned the internet and dropped 10,000 PowerShells on US servers and US networks. A PowerShell gives them remote backend access to gain persistence into any place there's a PowerShell, right? That's what it does. So the cybersecurity advisory is, um, is issued on March 10th. We do massive amounts of victim notifications. Um, and then within those two contracts, we have not done anything overly intrusive, right? We've notified the public through a cybersecurity advisory, we've not done the problem. We're able to reduce the attack surface by 94%, okay? So the question comes with 700, 800 networks and servers with still having Chinese PowerShells on them. Is that a big enough attack surface for the Chinese to do damage to people in the United States? Our answer to that question is gonna be yes, right? And if we have a legal way to deal with that, to neutralize the attack surface, we're going to do that as long as we can do it within the Constitution. And in this case, we swore out a warrant in the Southern District of Texas that allowed us to essentially go in with precision code and delete the malware that the Chinese saw installed to break the communication with the command and control back to the Chinese. Technically, we actually copied it first for evidentiary purposes, and then we deleted it in the removal of that malware broke the communication back to the Chinese. So I'll just reflect back to Rule 41 when I said instrumentalities of a crime. Would we all agree that malware installed on US infrastructure surreptitiously by the Chinese, by the Russians, or someone else is an instrumentality of a crime? I think all reasonable minds would say it's an instrumentality of a crime. When we do this work, right, it's through traditional probable cause. So there's an affidavit that any of you can go read, right, that underpins the, pro the establishment of probable cause to give us the ability to do that search and seizure on that infrastructure. And then I was just asked to touch briefly about the Securities and Exchange Commission. 
the SEC published a new rule that went into effect just within the last couple months that requires uh, SEC regulated entities, which is essentially any publicly traded company here in the United States, to report a material cyber intrusion to the SEC for transparency purposes to shareholders. As part of that, there's a law enforcement national security, sorry, a law enforcement public safety delay provision where those regulated companies who become victims, if they want a delay notification, they can engage with the FBI uh, to essentially do an equities check to see if it meets certain criteria. Anybody that wants additional information on that or may work for or have uh, relationships with any publicly traded company, there's a website on fbi.gov slash SEC, which spells all this out. There's now an intake form, which allows users to pretty simply answer about eight different questions. We take that, we square with the interagency from an equities perspective and see if it meets certain criteria. The criteria that would be most relevant is this. If you suffer a compromise and there is an unpatched zero day vulnerability that exists as a result of that compromise, obviously amplifying the presence of that cyber intrusion when no one else has pro, uh, uh, closed the zero day or zero day vulnerability is a big public safety issue for many of us in the United States. Those are the types of things we're evaluating. So I think that brings me to the end. Um, and so I'll pause there, get a drink, and take some questions. Terrific. Well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, fascinating and frightening uh, at the same time, although uh, you've had, you have a lot of success. So it's also uh, exciting to uh, hear about uh, the different uh, successes you've had in bringing down the ransomware networks like I. I'm really interested in the business model that you described. You said, I don't know if there are any business school students here, but how do these criminals, uh, there's the kind of old uh, axiom that there's no honor amongst thieves. How do they actually get together and split the profits? And, and what sorts of insights do you and the FBI have about all of those uh, machinations? So the traditional business model would be that your experts that are coding the malware um, generally are going to have safe haven status physically or be cored off from the rest of the ecosystem so that their identity is hard to identify. Um, and so from there, they publish malware. And a lot of these affiliates that deploy the malware um, are always interested in the most effective and the highest return on investment financially. And those affiliates earn their own reputations, no different than many of us would in different social media applications, and they become trusted. But when you look at the engagement with the victims, when you have a successful encryption event or a successful data encryption event, all the communications with the victim, even though it's happening with the victim and the affiliate, are still flowing back through the centralized database for the malware developers. So they're able to see the actual negotiations in real time and what the financial payment agreement is. And the payment comes to them first, and then they cut off the 80% for the code. So it's a very sophisticated model, a lot of credibility in terms of capabilities, in terms of the malware developer ecosystem, but also the codes. So it's sort of trust but verify. Sure. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the uh, all the different agencies you had on one slide, you know, the, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, the National Security Agency, CIA, Secret Service. Um, I mean, this is a kind of a very basic, uh, you know, uh, question. But um, do you do you have a coordination council? Do you get? I mean, is there a a, a kind of a, a body that convenes with some regularity and formality, or is it just ad hoc, case by case? <clears throat> it's more ad hoc, case by case, but not in a um, not in an ununified way. Mm -hmm. We have extremely mature relationships um, at the personal organization level with all those agencies and their personnel. So for example, if there's a critical infrastructure compromise, think an airport, um, we will almost always engage that entity with FBI and CISA together. Right? If there is a global disruption of a botnet to take down, we will work on that um, with Cyber Command, right? because we would have traditionally the domestic element of that disruption, Cyber Command, 
So the Cyber Command is part of NSA. It's so under really. the big DOD construct, but it's technically separate. Right? Um, and so it, um, we have very, very mature relationships, ongoing dialogue about strategic intent. Um, so that's how I would describe it. Um, you uh, spoke uh, in the slide on legal authorities that, that you operate under. Uh, you, one of them is the Section 702 under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, you mentioned how it allows access to you know, foreign communications passing through U.S. networks. That is uh, rather well known these days for lots of reasons, but including it, its reauthorization status. Uh, Director Ray and, and others uh, have spoken about how 702 is, uh, it, you know, one is essential to U.S. national security and intelligence uh, operation, but in particular for cyber, is that uh, how, how does 7, you know, what is the cyber uh, dimension that is to say for, for your cyber security investigations and disruptions, how does the 702 data factor in? So I just want to be really careful here because we're all under like very strict guidelines okay. about what we can, can, can and can't say on 702. I would just say this, it is the most agile and effective tool we have in the intelligence community writ large, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not an FBI specific statement, it is truly a irreplaceable tool in the intelligence community. Yeah. Right, and then I think it's, uh, was it extended? I think maybe it was extended briefly, but it will come up again. It, it, would have sunset uh, in this, well, just the end of last year. There was some uh, uh, consensus extension, and but it uh, is still not definitively reauthorized. Is my is my understanding? Um, the the, uh, the the director uh, spoke. Uh, you mentioned the the, um, the House committee on the side uh, the Chinese Communist Party on Volt Typhoon. That was another success that sure. was, I think, formally announced, I believe, just yesterday. I believe. It had a, what was the nature of that? What threat did the US face from that? So Microsoft started publishing on Volt Typhoon in about um, mid-2023, uh, and the uh, Chinese's intent, successful intent to compromise US interest, critical infrastructure here and to gain persistent footholds in that critical infrastructure. Um, and so the conversation yesterday on Capitol Hill with the director and General Nakasone and Director Easterly um, and others was about the persistence of the Chinese threat targeting critical infrastructure to essentially gain more and more persistence to impact our critical infrastructure. We had a role um, that was detailed in the uh, disruption announcement in terms of dealing with one of the obfuscation networks under Rule 41, as we just described. Um, it's tremendous work by our team. We're very, very proud of it. But the reality is there's a lot more to do. Mm -hmm. I know that, um, and I, we talked a little bit about this uh, with, uh, with the cybersecurity class, uh, but uh, for, for other takedowns, one of the experiences that, that I've had is that the, I mean, not that I'm in a position to evaluate it, but the technologists and companies uh, that I work with have been just just supremely impressed with the technical capabilities of uh, uh, many of your colleagues at uh, at the FBI, um, and you know, public may not understand that you have this technical capability that is critical to a lot of the successful takedowns, disruption activities. Um, you know, where do they come from? I mean, do they go through the same? Training and well, I, I just think, you know, I've been with the FBI for over 20 years, which is hard for me to believe at this point, but um, most of us in my era joined post 9-11 because of 9-11. <laughs> um, and I think many of us believe that the reason we all apply is because of the mission, which is true. It's a phenomenal mission. And the mission causes you to stay, but the people are just wonderful. And the people are what keep all of us there and happy. And, I think our retention rate is somewhere near 99.7%, which is extremely high. Uh, but I think we're really proud of that, and we're really proud of um, the people that we have to work with. And the uh, technical skills that you're describing, I think they're true. They just happen to be some of our, our talent that we have throughout the organization. I'm going to open it up uh, in the room after just a question uh, about coordination globally. You talked about the domestic uh, agencies with which you collaborate. Mm -hmm. 
Is it work pretty smoothly with counterparts? And who are the counterparts that you work with internationally? We have tremendous relationships globally. I mean, none of the countries that I would list here are going to surprise anyone. You know, tremendous working relationships with the Five Eyes and with some of the traditional strong cyber capabilities, the Dutch, the Germans, the Poles, et cetera. We have tremendous working relationships. They're tremendously capable partners as well. And fostering and maturing those relationships against the global threat is just supremely Okay, let's uh, have you have please. wait for the microphone and Hi, um, I have a question about Bureau's case assignment model. Um, I understand cases are assigned based off of where malware is first detected, but the different RAs and field offices will have different levels of or different amounts of technical staff, different amounts of computer scientists, um, you know, different familiarity with filling out requests for FISA warrants. Uh, I'm curious if there have been any discussions about adjusting the case assignment model in the cyber domain uh, so that, you know, their uh, smaller RAs don't feel pitted against nation state adversaries. All right, you obviously know something. Yeah, <laughs> wow. Um, what I would say is that uh, some of what you said is true, but I want to course correct a few things. Assignments of cases uh, on the criminal side um, are varied, right? About how they actually sync with the field office. Sometimes it's based off of first victim, which deals with the venue issue from a Executed perspective, which becomes an important derivative conversation. Sometimes it's that we see that the business model of a new variant is tied to a previously known ransomware gang that uh, ran on a variant under a different brand and wanting to couple that together where there's expertise already exists, right? Um, what we've learned in terms of uh, assignments is this that we need scalability, right? So, for example, the most prolific uh, ransomware variant right now is Lockbit 3.0. Right? Uh, Lockbit 3.0 is run out of our FBI Newark field office. If we had that assigned, to, let's use my previous background. I love the people in New Orleans, right? If we had that case assigned to the FBI New Orleans division, there's no way they have the <coughs> staff in terms of volume to deal with that size of a case. So some of this becomes a scale issue. In terms of the comment about pitted against each other, I would need to talk to you more about what that means. I think that we are trying to grow capacity and capability in real time. Uh, and that remains a goal of mine and of the Bureau at the large. Um, so I'd be interested in knowing a little bit more about that piece. Oh, um, my apologies. I'm no, not pitted okay. against nation state adversaries oh, yeah. as a smaller office. Yeah, well. Again, I would need to know is the exact example, but what we're trying to do is on the nation state side, we have a very specific model that couples different size field offices to work together to bring a force multiplier effect against nation states. I think we have made some internal tweaks to that model recently to gain efficiencies, but like everything, nothing is going to be perfect organizationally and it's just an evolution for us. Um, I, I think the best number I can give you is this. It's you know, Director Ray in his testimony yesterday said, just with China, right? Um, best case scenario, we're outnumbered 50 to 1. Best case scenario. That's not an FBI statement, that's a broader statement. And so when you look at that, it's just a scale issue for all of us. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks for being here. Sure. Uh, you, you mentioned that retention is 99 plus per percent across the FBI. I'm wondering what it is specifically in the cyber division. Yeah. Um, so it's a great question. So um, we have uh, less of a, the number for our cyber personnel is smaller than the 99.7% it is, but it's not a significant drop. Um, I don't know the exact number, so I don't want to say it publicly because I don't know it. Uh, but where we have retention problems, um, we almost uh, have no ability to compete. So for example, we've lost people because some of the big strategics have come to them and said, what do you want to include salary? What do you want in terms of benefits? What do you want in terms of work-life balance, in terms of work from home, which our ability to offer work from home in a classified environment is very, very challenging, right? We're never going to compete. 
compete with that, and we're not going to try to compete with that. We're going to try to compete on mission. We're going to try to compete on your FBI experience as an employee and you having a well-rounded out career. And so we're dealing with high pay scenarios where we just, we just want to try to compete. I mean, the factors are two and a half, three X different, right? Um, but, you know, we're doing pretty well, to be honest with you. I think where we're having challenges is bringing people into the organization in cyber because it's so difficult to attract that talent initially at a young age for a lower salary than they can get somewhere else. So once we're getting people in, we're fairly successful, but sometimes getting people in proves to be a challenge. Do you, you provide training? I mean, in other words, do you grow oh, yeah. that capability oh, yeah. organically? Absolutely. Absolutely. Does that help? Okay. Um, hi. Yeah, you clearly had some uh, amazing successes. I guess my question is, what's on your wish list? Um, if you could, you know, someone would wave a magic wand and give you what you wanted to improve your capabilities of responding to cyber risks, what would it be? Would it be resources? Would it be the policy environment? Would it be international cooperation? Like what, what would be the places that you would be pushing most um, for improvement? For me, the number one uh, right out of the gate is liability and privilege protection to engage with victims. And so um, that CIRCIA, which is the critical infrastructure reporting requirement um, that's been uh, published, that'll become law in, in roughly a year and a half, that gives liability and privilege protection for victims to engage with certain other government agencies, but not the FBI. And I think that's really, that's just, it's not even an FBI statement. If we want victims to come forward, we should give them broad liability and privilege protections, period, to engage with the US government. And right now, that doesn't exist. And I think that is a, a no cost option that is um, legislatively challenging, right? But it's a zero dollar uh, solution that would be have an outsized impact. First of all, thank you very much for uh, your time today. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the dynamic in the Bureau, specific in the cyber division, of the, I'd say, like competing incentives for law enforcement and counter intel? Seems like one was going to be short term, one might be long term. And where do you think that's going to go in the future? I'm not sure I understand. Can you rephrase that? I, well, from the slides, it seems like the Bureau has made like a pretty significant shift away from like name and shame and kind of the indictment approach to combating uh, strategic yep. cyber threats. Um, do you imagine that that's going to stay the same? Uh, it seems like uh, from the slides, it's more like a strategic counter intel. Uh, I don't want to say like shift, but kind of the emphasis. Do you think that's going to continue to stay that way? So I think so. Two answers, right? I think it's going to stay that way because the interagency, and when I talk about the interagency, I'm really talking about those of us with, with operational authorities, right, to impose costs, have really rallied around the imposition of cost model, right? And so when we talk about how we degrade adversaries, we're all coalesced around that language, which is directly derivative of our strategy, NSA strategy, cyber command strategy. And so I don't think that's going to change. That's becoming more and more and more solid over time. And the relationships are maturing in a way that's fair with where we are in time. Right? In three years from now, we'll be better with our interagency partners and they'll be better with us than we are now. That's not because none of us are trying. It's just the evolution of organizations. Where I think there's going to be a shift is you're going to see more and more presence of cyber capable actors here in the United States. Um, and I think that is going to bring back into focus our traditional rule of law law enforcement approach that will be coupled with that, but being still derivative of all of our investigative work. Hey, Bob. Hey, while people are thinking of other questions, uh, let me follow up on uh, one of your uh, responses about the wish list, which is, you know, to, to facilitate interaction with the private sector. One of the um, one of the very prominent areas of, uh, uh, of public communication from the FBI, from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, is public-private uh, cooperation and collaboration. 
you were featured in the Wall Street Journal along with uh, your uh, boss, the director uh, of the FBI, um, on the, on this question, and, and you talked about the um, level of of uh, interaction and the quality of the uh, of those interactions. I think you maybe described it as providing Ritz level interaction uh, in that Wall Street Journal article. Good picture, by the way. Um, and um, how and one of the uh, the, the points that, that you know the, the FBI mentions you mentioned is that uh, the companies that fall victim to cyber attacks are in fact victims and uh, you know deserve to be treated with respect for the information that they share. Um, how does that? Um, I know that it, it, you mentioned that the. the Privilege, you know, the, the liability for sharing the privilege, uh, a possible waiver or or diminution of the confidentiality of the information. How do you, how do you how do you deal with that uh, in terms of making the private sector that you need to collaborate with feel comfortable uh, in in working with you and, and letting you be useful to them and again helping your mission? There's uh, generally when I talk in groups like this, I talk a lot about the before intrusion phase, right, of a relationship. And, you know, those relationships have to be familiar uh, between an organization and the FBI at the, <coughs> at the human name level, not at, in my world, not at a squad level, but at a person level. Uh, and they have to be built on trust, primarily through expectation sharing, and then bilateral sharing of intelligence before intrusion so that everyone understands how do you want the FBI to engage with you when an intrusion happens? What is the FBI gonna ask for? Is a company or an organization actually willing to provide that? Many are not, and we understand that there is no statutory obligation for that. And so it just becomes this trust-based relationship conversation that starts long, long, long before the intrusion actually happens. And we still have organizations that um, engage us during an intrusion and they say, hey, we're ready for the FBI to come in and remediate all of our systems. But the FBI has never done that. Uh, we're never going to do that. We don't have the capability or the capacity to do that. And there's a multi-billion dollar industry built around doing that. And so that's just an example of where the proper conversations haven't been had about expectations on all sides. So some simple questions, you know, if there's an intrusion, who do you want the FBI to engage with? Do you want it to be in person? Do you want it to be on the phone? Do you want it to be through another medium? Right? Do you want it to be set up at the request of the FBI or at a timeline that you're okay with as an organization? Like all these questions and these conversations lead to comfort and trust. And so that's how we start. One of the, uh, is, uh, do I have another question? So we have some questions from oh. those in the ceiling, our remote. Viewers, may I ask two? Yeah. I'm going to ask two of all of them. There's a bunch of good ones. Um, the first is, can you talk about the implications or differences related to protecting software as a service versus plat uh, platform as a service versus traditional um, infrastructure and how that changes your approach? Um, so that's one question. Uh, and then the second question is, um, do you ever release your tools for researchers? I think that's a good way to round us out and thinking about how the academic community might be in dialogue <laughs> with you. Are there things that um, we might, we as academic communities um, might have access to, um, especially for the question answer related to malware um, and analyzing malware? Sure. Um, let me take the first one first. I'm going to take a little different spin on it because it, I think it may be more relevant. Um, we don't see software as a service, platform as a service, third party application. Uh, we see them all as types of supply chain risks, right? Because of the update processes. And so the example I use is this. We often talk in, in whether it's the academic environment, whether it's in corporate America about competitors. And I think the better term when it comes to cyber is peers. And so what third party applications are your peers using that if an adversary knew that this group of peer companies or peer prestigious academic universities were using, that if they compromised that, they would have an outsized impact because they could compromise all the peers using that third party application. 
it's a really, really healthy conversation for many, many different people and one that I find isn't had enough, right? Uh, in terms of sharing tools, uh, we don't share tools, but we do share malware executables when we get our hands on them. And so there's a host of reasons we do that uh, to um, inform the research community, to inform uh, those writing patches and code uh, to, uh, to protect against those. Um, and we share that fairly, uh, I don't want to say narrowly, we share that um, pretty broadly with those in that ecosystem. And so that was true in 2023 on at least three occasions that I know of. Great, thank you. Sorry, I, I... It's okay. <laughs> Technology. Um, I have one final question for me, if, if I could. I know we still have a couple minutes. Um, what advice do you have for students who might be looking to engage with this work at any level? Are there things to look out for and be worried about? Ethical concerns that you might have as you engage with this work? Things that um, you wish you knew when, when you started? Um, you know, for the students in this room and outside this room, um, who might be watching. Do you have any words of wisdom? I would just say there is a uh, obviously heavily, heavily reported on, research and reported on that the uh, the gap in cybersecurity and cyber operational positions that exist in, in America, right? not necessarily in the government, and the number of people who are qualified or interested in doing them, that, that gap is enormous, right? Um, and there is a growing need for that as we go into the generative AI space and the broader ML space, many of those same academic programs apply to those uh, individuals. What I would say to your core question is this. Um, the Cyber Safety Review Board is in its third iteration. It was a board stood up in 2021. Um, I have a, a role in that board with all of my colleagues in the, in the federal government at the big agencies, as well as many in private sector. And the first study was the log4j, log4shell vulnerability, which was a massive Apache vulnerability in, in, open, in an open coding environment. A very, very difficult uh, vulnerability to patch because you know it's scripted throughout entire operating systems. <clears throat> um, one of the findings that I think is most interesting in that report is that there are no academic standards for secure coding in the United States. And so when you equate that to, I have a civil engineering degree, imagine the day where we said there are no safety standards for civil engineers to build bridges, right? That's the analogy, right? We would be like, that's ridiculous. Um, well, there are no standards within the academic system in the United States for secure coding. And that's probably something that needs attention as we do secure by design work over the next decade. Um, and something that I think I would encourage all of you to be part of that solution. Where do you think that solution comes from? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that's a, a big and important order for many of us to take up in our work. Um, I want to thank you both so much for joining us tonight, for sharing so much. And thank you all for coming, those in the room, those in the ceiling, those in the future. Um, thank you all again. <laughs> thank you.